I believe this is the fastest way right now to achieve financial freedom. If you're looking to do it from real estate, not that you can't do it in business or other things, but if you're looking real estate, I believe this is the fastest, uh, most profitable way that is also a huge win and has tons of social benefits. Hey everyone, welcome back to the Millionaire Series. My name is Joe Moffitt with Master Life by Design and I am super excited for our guest speaker, Sam Weger. He is here. He's part of our Go Abundance Mastermind. We're in the same mastermind together, but this guy's been on podcast after podcast after podcast. He's got some really exciting things. I don't know all the details, but I'm excited to dive in just like you guys are. Sam, thanks for being on the show. We appreciate having you. Thanks, Joe. Appreciate it, man. This is going to be great. I'm, I'm looking forward to it. It's going to be fun. Love the name, by the way. Life by Design. Let's go. That's right, baby. You got to design life the way you want it and build everything else around it. But this is about you, not me. But anyway, well, look, I'd love to find out kind of where you grew up. How did you get to where you are today? Just a little bit of your background. We don't have to take all the entire show, but just love to hear a little bit more about that time frame. And then once you get there, we'll kind of see where things take us and we'll jump in from that point. Yeah, dude, I can just kick off with the upbringing. I was, uh, I had a unique upbringing, man. My dad was a pastor. Uh, he worked for, a, he worked for a, a school called Liberty University. It's the largest evangelical Christian school in the world. And he worked there since they were trailers, um, since they were just in trailers and they're, they're a big, big school now. And so uh, I got to, I got to grow up in a big family. I'm one of eight siblings. And uh, so it was a town called Lynchburg, Virginia, right outside of Lynchburg, Virginia. And just Man, um, homeschooled. My parents decided they didn't want uh, the government influencing me in my education. They wanted to take it in their own hands. So Come I don't on. know. Are you guys homeschooled? Are you homeschooling? No, we were yeah. for okay. a little, but yeah. okay. Well, it's rough. I mean, well, when you got eight kids, you got a pretty much a mini school already. So my yeah. mom, I guess it was just easier. But um, yeah, raised in the country. Really grateful for my upbringing. It allowed me to do lots of uh, things. It allowed me to pursue interests that I had at a young age. And I always tell parents this because I also coached, I got into martial arts when I was really young and I coached martial arts for like 15 years. Very cool. And I always tell parents, you know, the best thing you can do is get your kids. And my parents were amazing at this because they had eight kids. They couldn't spend all their time with them. They just couldn't. There wasn't enough time. And they did a good job of getting me in front of other mentors. So they put me with a martial arts coach. They put me with a soccer coach and they would, they would seek out good, what they deemed are godly men or good men. And they would put me around those people. And I, so I ended up having like, I had all these fathers. I had my dad, dad, who I, I loved, but then I had my martial arts coach who became like a second father to me. And so I just had all this really, really, really great mentorship. And I'm so grateful for my parents for that. When I was 15 years old, my martial arts coach approached my parents. He was burnt out and his dream was to fish on the pro bass, like the bass fishing circuit. And he said, hey guys, I've been watching your son, Sam. I'm done with this school. I want to sell it to Sam. My parents were like blown away. They were like, what? He's 15. No way. He, and my, my instructor said, I will hire him a business consultant that will hold his hand. And it, it was, this was in a small town outside of Lynchburg, like 2000 people. And he, they said, uh, they said, he said, uh, and I'll sell it to you for $15,000. <laughs> my, my parents were not wealthy by any stretch of the imagination. <laughs> no, Somehow man. they came up with 15 grand. They lent it to their 15 year old. And here I go spiking my hair. So I look older and I'm more mature. And uh, that was how I cut my teeth in entrepreneurship. Joe was, was, wow. was diving into that and you know, the rest we can go into whatever, but that was kind of the initial, the initial upbringing. Wow. That's amazing. How long did you run that school for? I mean, I still, so, so I grew it from a little school in that town. We, we opened up a school. I opened up a school a couple of years later in uh, Charlottesville, Virginia, which is where university of Virginia is. Um, I'm really proud that school became one of the top schools in the United States. It, it hit the top 1% in terms of number of students and revenue that we generated. Wow. And um, then I moved to Charlotte. I bought two more and I just kind of built a little organization of six martial arts schools. So that, that was my main gig. And then I still, I, I just finished literally as of like one week ago. I just sold my last one off. So I own half of two right now with two amazing partners um, of two of the two of the other ones. The other ones I sold off to the operators and I own a brand called Up Level Martial Arts and we licensed the brand back to the schools. Mm. So I'm involved, but I'm not nearly as involved as I used to be. And that's that's a full cycle. I mean, there's a lot I could say, but that's, that's a good 15, 17 years I just described over that period <laughs> of time. Absolutely. What was the biggest lesson you learned about business on that journey? Because I... 
I coach a lot of people, they jump into startups and they think it's going to, you know, they're going to make a million dollars their first year and life shows them, you know, it's not as easy as we think. Um, there's a lot of lessons, a lot of growth opportunities. So what was the biggest takeaway during that season for you? Yeah, it's really simple, man. It was, if you don't turn decades into days, you will, you will always be behind in the business world. Oh, how That's do you do and- that? Yeah, the, the, the way that I learned it was like people will, like here's how it goes. People will come to me now and they'll ask me a business question. And, and th- this is not me gloating or whatever. I just, you can tell by the questions people ask, you can tell where they're at in their journey of entrepreneurship. And yep. I find these people that are trying to do it all alone. And I think like, oh my gosh, like I didn't have to learn those same lessons that a lot of these people out there that, like you said, they jump into startups, they do these things. And the reason I didn't have to is because the thing that my martial arts instructor did before he left me with the school at 15 was he hired me a business consultant. Mm. And that business consultant came in, sat me down and said, I don't care. I don't care about anything other than that you memorize this script. And I was like, what? And I remember one time in this, in a meeting, I was like, I was like rehearsing a script. So I was like, okay, well, it's 95 bucks. How do you want to pay for that? And he snapped at me. He was like, it's not bucks. It's dollars. You never call it buck. We don't use slang here. And I was like, so this was like an old school business consultant that just like taught me how to do business. He gave Come me a on. franchise system. And like, <clears throat> it would have, it would have taken me literally a decade to mm. create or to come. No, I, no, that's not even true. I never would have come up with it. never. Wow. I wouldn't have written those scripts. So if, if someone's out there is trying to succeed in the business world, it, and not have someone like yourself, like your team, like someone alongside of you that's like supporting you and coaching you and giving you strategies and mindset. It's strategies and mindset. You're like you. You aren't gonna win, win, win. You might do okay, but you aren't gonna win. Yeah. No, that's so good. You know, I love I love what Tony Robbins says. Right. Like, mm-hmm. there's no shortage of strategies. We're in the information yeah. age right now. You can go online and Google anything right now. But right. what gives people the competitive edge is their psychology, the way they think, so right? 2008, 2020, when all these world demics were happening, right? The world was melting. People are freaking out. But then there's others that are like, this is going to be the biggest financial opportunity that I'm going to take advantage of, right? Not to say that, you know, the death or COVID and everything is, you know, to get a gain off of that, although the hospitals are doing that. So that's a whole nother yeah. topic. We won't go into that. But <laughs> Where are we going, but, Joe? Are we going there? <laughs> <laughs> but it's the mindset. What's the mindset that we're entering in business with? And so that's what gives people the competitive edge. That's what gave Michael Jordan the competitive edge. Kobe Bryant, right? Uh, was it Tim Grover who was their coach? Right. And it's like, yeah. that's what gives them the edge. So anyway, I absolutely oh, love that that recommendation around the business consultant was there. What a gift. What a gift. And beautiful gift. And what I also say is like, and I, I know you probably already did this, but like, how amazing are your parents to figure out a way to make that happen for you? Like with eight kids, right? Like, come on. How many did your parents buy any other kids' businesses? No. <laughs> <laughs> but it's I, sure am, all. I am so indebted to them. I thank them every day. I try to support them. I've brought I I when I got into my like entrepreneurial journey, I started I got connected with Tony Robbins and started going to every event I could. I bought them Tony Robbins coaching. I sent them to a date with Destiny. Yes. <laughs> that may not have been the best. You know, I tried <laughs> to like mend their, you know, tried to bring them closer together as a couple. I was like that. I was the middle. I should have maybe led with that. I was the middle of eight kids, as middle as you can get. I'm fifth from the top, right? And so I was the one that was just like, y'all, like everybody get along. Mom, dad, you're good. And I was the fixer, at least the, at least that's what I wanted to do. You know, I couldn't always do it, but um, that's that, that belief that, that, that mindset has actually served me very well. It can be detrimental sometimes, but trying to wanting to serve people, wanting people to feel good and enjoy life and get along. But anyway, we digress. We can go in that direction. But I appreciate that, man. And that's a lesson for those out there, right? Like sometimes you our greatest strength is actually our kryptonite in other areas, right? And so so, um, you got to be careful when you're using it and where and how. And so anyway, um, very cool. 
Very cool. Yeah. All right. So you got into the martial arts scene. You're you're selling those off right now. And so after you got into the entrepreneurial world through the martial arts, um, what then? Where did you go from there? Obviously, you were making some money, if not de- how much were you probably making at your peak? Let's dive into numbers. People are like, oh, laundry mats and real estate, but martial arts? Yeah, when I was at my peak running five or six schools, I was probably taking home, if I calculate like maybe some some personal things I expensed to the business, maybe three fifty, four hundred. Wow, a year. Yeah. That's amazing. How many yeah. of you out there would love to have five or six schools running and make about three hundred and fifty, four hundred K a year? Right. Like that's fairly. over 30 to 40, almost 35 grand a month. It was fairly, right. it was fairly passive. There were little spurts up to like, I can remember a month or two where I'd brag to my friends that I did 50 that month. Um, and, and, and I always was good at leverage at finding someone who could do it better than me and putting them in place. And that, by the way, that, that I think is my biggest superpower and my biggest weakness. Mm. I don't feel like I'm good at it. So I find someone else to do it. Ah, gotcha. Because I'm insecure about how I show up. I'm insecure about how I show up to this is like dead. I, I've talked to like my counselors about that. I've talked to my wife about this. Like the reason I'm good at putting people in place and building a business and stepping away is because in my head, I'm just like, someone will do it better than me. Anybody will do it better than me. Someone will do it better than me. Anybody will do it better than me. But, but, but I belief. learned to put people in place and be able to step away. It's the only way you run six, six schools, right? Um, That's awesome. So I want to dig into that because people who are listening, um, our audience here is, you know, people who have a nine to five, a good paying nine to five, they're, you know, they're just trapped in it, right? The money's great, right? Making 250 or more. We have small business owners that are just crushing it, but no passive income. But with that being said, you hit on something that's really important is leveraging. And so how as you were out there leveraging, having that belief that there's other people out there that are better than you, um, usually that's the belief we want people to have, right? That's not the belief they come in with, but we want them to have um, when it comes to leveraging because that's the only way to scale. But for you, how did you go out there? What were some of the ways that you tried to find people who were better than you? Because that's a big challenge for a lot of people because they hold the belief, at least the common belief is that no one can do it like me, which was the opposite of yours. But how did you go about finding people who were better than you? Yeah, man, I, I'm, I think I'm still trying to, I think I'm st- like, that is a code I'm still trying to crack. We, there is turnover even in all of our yeah. businesses now in the martial arts school. So I don't, I don't want to project that I have that down perfectly or the perfect formula. I think in the martial arts business, you know, it was a lot of homegrown people. It was a lot of people that came up through your culture that knew you, that, you know, were younger, were more energetic or whatever, and would bring just a different vibe to the party. But I would say, you know, in the martial arts business, we definitely were encouraged to not hire as much from outside just because the culture can, it can mess with the culture. I mean, a martial arts school, if you run it correctly, it's like a yeah, it's, it's 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 a mini good cult kind of thing because it's like yeah. everybody knows each other. You're you know each school yeah. has two to three hundred students and they're they're a little force for good and and it's cool. But if you mess with that, which is bringing the outside instructor, so finding people from inside, I think another strategy that I would always use is, you know, it's a concept I talk about and I teach when I do some coaching, and that is just like, you know, I had a mentor one time tell me, "Hey Sam, your job as a leader is to do nothing more than just pass the football." And I was like, "What do you mean?" He goes, your job is not to make sure they run plays with it. You just give people the opportunity to run a play with the football. So you just pass the football, pass the football, pass the football, pass the football. And then somebody's, some people are just going to hand the football back to you. Yeah. What do you, why'd you give it to me? Oh, okay. <laughs> sorry. Some people will be like, oh, this is cool. And they'll stand there. And some people will be like, you pass me the football. Let's go. And they'll go run a play for you. And the people, and you just watch. And as a leader, you're just passing the football, passing the football. Hey, Go take over that. Take over the, I'll give some practical examples. Go take over that class. I want you to line up class today. Hey, I want you to take that sales meeting. These little opportunities that I would get to pass the football and the people who would go and run plays with them versus just look at it or look at me or toss it back or be like, what the hell are you doing? What the heck are you thinking? You know, like those people that run plays with it, I want to be with them. So yeah. it, was just a, it was a lot of my, my, my instructor said, never choose. 
You take the shotgun approach, approach you choose everybody, and you let them sort themselves. <laughs> oh, what a <laughs> for good better or for worse. Ship. Actually, I think that that's that's a similar mindset because he was involved in a lot of multi-level marketing companies. Similar mindset of like, hey, I'm not going to try to like find the perfect person. I want you on my team. You guys will sort yourself as to your level of motivation, where you're at in your life, how much resources you have to devote to this, et cetera, et cetera. So that was the approach that we took and it served me very, very well. Yeah, that's amazing. Yeah, Greg Cardone, he the cream will rise to the top, right? And he's he cuts off the bottom 10% every week or every month. And so absolutely true. And when it comes to hiring people, at least from what I've learned and what I've helped coach people around, so many times we look at a resume and we see that they have certain knowledge and we see that they have these skill sets, but that doesn't tell me anything about the person. Anyone can go get a piece of paper from a school right? Anyone can learn something. What I like to do is when I'm looking at bringing people on board, either as a coach or VA or what, a CPA, I want to know what are your habits? Because if you have good habits, I know that I can give you something and you're going to take it and run with it and you're going to build off of it. The other thing is the most important thing for me is what's your attitude like? Because if you have a piss poor attitude, right? Like it's all about you then you're not a team player. We're building something as a team, right? Like that's what culture is all about. And so I want you to run with it. I want you to have good habits, but is your attitude I, or is it we, right? And I remember, you know, for mar everyone listening that's married and maybe in business or whatnot, I remember when me and my wife, we first, um, you know, started dating and then we got married and we had our bank account separate and, and she's like, yeah, this is what I made. And I'm like, this is what we made. Or if I made money, I was like, this is what we made. And and she looked at me and like, so it's, we're a team, right? And so same awesome. thing in business. Are you a team? What's your attitude like? And so those can help. Now, obviously they got to perform the job and be able to run with the football, like you said. So anyway. Yeah, that, no, that reminds me, I'll add on to that is that, um, you know, three questions Tony Robbins teaches you to ask any new employer in, in one of his business trainings. He says, you know, can they do the job? And if they're there in front of you, in front of interview, like, yeah, they probably can. Then will they do the job? Not just temporarily, but will they do it long, long term, you know? And then the third question is kind of what I feel like you're explaining, which is like, are they a good team fit? Do they fit the values yeah. that we're trying to espouse in this, in this company, you know? So can they do the job? Will they do the job? Is this person a good team fit? I have, those are like three questions that I've always kind of mulled over when hiring people and bringing people in as well. And I'll, and I'll say, I'll say someone, I'll say something else. I, this was only a, a, two years ago. I also realized that I don't think I'm the best person at always choosing. I mean, I, I even started this off by saying, yeah, yeah. Like, I don't think I figured this out. And so I brought in, so I have a COO now that runs all my companies. And I just feel like he's a better, I feel like he does a better job. I I, love so I'm just like, if you can do a better job and a be, he's a whatever, for whatever reason, better judge of character. I feel like when I go into interviews, I always am like, I don't know. Maybe it's just my personalities. I'm, I'm always trying to like change them. I'm always trying to see just the good in them. And I need someone that in an interview can kind of see like, no, this, I, I, I see the good in you. And I see this side that's going to come out in three months. <laughs> 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 and that's my buddy. That is my buddy and COO and now business partner, Ramu. That's he, that is what he does. He, he just looks at everything with that little bit more level head. I'm here to like, yeah, like you can do it. Yeah, you I'll hire you. And then we're going to change the world together. And he's just like, no, bro, like you were trying to inspire someone when you should be letting <laughs> them do the talking, not you. And I'm like, you're right. So call it a personality thing. I just realized sometimes if I can bring other people in, man, I, my one sided vision of who someone is, is not the best way to look at it. I need additional perspectives on on new hires. That's been game changing for me. I haven't even really thought about that in a while till you asked that and we're having this conversation, but that's been hugely game changing. Yeah. For those of you that are looking to start a business, you have a business or you're creating, you know, a business in real estate or whatnot, you're go if you want to scale, you have to leverage. It's there's that's the hardest part as an entrepreneur. Um, you know, obviously, Sam, I love your vulnerability and just, you know, your openness <laughs> around it. Honestly, like it's rare that people are honest and authentic and so open. So I really appreciate that that about you reminds me of me. Um, but here's what I will say is if you're listening and you're thinking about scaling, you have to understand how to hire or have someone like Sam has that can actually do the hiring for you. Because were you by any chance, were you at the um, Miami Go Abundance event last year? 
I wasn't. Oh, I okay. About, I heard I about it, I but I wasn't. It. Yeah. It was a smaller well, event, if I remember correctly. <clears throat> It was the only event where they have it's in Miami and it's the only hotel in Miami that was getting our entire pool redone. It was like, ugh. anyway, um, here's what I will say. <laughs> Je- the reason why I'm bringing this up is Jeff Hoffman, who spoke for us at the Go GoBundance event. He's the owner of Priceline. He's a billionaire, owned the Florida Marlins before he sold it. He said his number one job is to find a plus talent. That's all he does. And then his team will do the rest. And so that just speaks. It hit me because it was like, man, how important is it to have great people? And I, I've, you know, I remember, um, I was talking with, uh, with Jason Drees, a buddy of mine, and he was like, pay people more than the position's worth. And if you do that, if you pay Beautiful. people more than the position's worth, they're going to stay. They're going to be part of it. And then that's when you wrap in values and mission and culture all in one. And now you and you give them input. And anyway, we're going down a whole rabbit hole here around. No, nope, but uh, a lot of these culture, ideas, no. I've spent I've spent a decent amount of time. Um, we hired Jeff Hoffman for a day and spent a day with him to, to get coaching on our business and things. And so he. It was a it was a donation actually to to one life fully lived to be honest but um because I don't think Jeff took anything from that I think it was all a donation I think about it what a guy uh yeah and just on a total side note we found out that he flew coach it was a charity event we found out he flew coach to the charity event we we're just like this is the most humble billionaire that walks around in jeans and a t shirt that you think is like could own like a gas station <laughs> like that he's like but anyway uh but a lot of these ideas were informed by him i i i I made him my study for a good year of just like reading his book scale figuring out his mindset some of the stories he tells are just so ah he's got some powerful stories man man there's this one i I got it i'll I'll tell it real fast but yeah there's this one where he talks about when in the early days of priceline they, they were bringing all these new coders every day coders coders computer coders and one day he pops open the door and he sticks his head and he's like, hey, guys, I'm going down to the uh, I'm going to the store. Do you guys need anything? And everybody knew who he was. He's the founder. He's one of the owners. Like no one's going to ask him to do that, even if he even if he's nice enough to say that. And so everybody's like, no, no, no. But there was a new guy who didn't know who he was. He didn't know he was Jeff Hoffman. And he's like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Actually, is that store right next to the dry cleaners? Is that where you're going? And Jeff was like, well, yeah, now that I think about it is he's like, would you mind picking up my dry cleaners on the way there? And he's and and Jeff was like, yeah, I, I don't mind. And all the other guys like started to get white. There's like this guy has no clue who he is. They have no clue that they're just asking the founder, the billionaire, the owner. Maybe he wasn't a billionaire at the time, but, you know, he was the big, the head, the, you know, the big guy. And and so Jeff goes to leave. One of the other guys rushes out and is like, hey, man, I'll pick up his dry cleaning. Forget he asked that. I got it. Don't worry about it. You go do your thing. And Jeff looks at him and he goes, that kid in there is about 28 times smarter than me doing something I could never, ever do. He's coding a multi-billion dollar software for us. I'll pick up his damn dry cleaning. Come on. Like, and it was just like this servant attitude of like, I'll do anything for this kid, right? So not only hiring that talent, but then just serving them. It was just a really big like mindset shift, right? Because we all want to be the person that's like, you know, at the top, but here he's at the top, like just picking up dry cleaning. It was coolest story dude i'll remember that story to the day to the day i die right i remember hearing that too man he's such a humble guy and he actually spoke at our we at our church our business ministry is a oh, no kidding path, it's called pathfinders and um actually i got it this evening and they teach you how to win in the marketplace and um anyway jeff got a ch- chance to speak at our church for the pathfinder event and uh i don't know if he shared that story or not but um what a guy man you're so right and he's so humble and and for everyone listening you know here's what i will say i led many years with pride when i accomplished something um but all that was was a performance based spirit i'll say right mm. it came from all these insecurities around rejection mm. not being good enough right all performance based and and so i've been doing a lot of work to uproot a lot of that and really to be humble and um man it, i don't know if i wrote it down and I don't want to go off script here because this is all about you. But no, the other no, this day, is good, man. I'm learning too. I got <laughs> the other day I was I was sitting there and I was thinking about, you know, the word humility and thinking about all these great leaders and 
they're so humble. And I, and I wrote down a definition that came to me. I feel like the spirit gave it to me, but I wrote down humility is when you own something that you've accomplished and the gifts that you have, when you just own it versus you going around and trying to gloat about it mm. and said, and that's humility in, to wow. me. And so um, I've seen so many successful people lead with humility and that's exactly what Jeff does. And I think that's what makes him so special. And that's why, He's created what he's created. So, so well said. So anyway. well said. Yeah. Love it. Cool, man. Well, awesome. So let's jump in from, from, uh, after the martial arts. And as you were transitioning, where did you go and tell us what you're doing now? Yeah. So, so along this journey of running martial arts schools, I, I did buy some homes. I bought, uh, my first real estate property, if you will, was a three bedroom, three bath condo in Charlottesville, Virginia, university of Virginia. And, I house hacked it is the technical term, right? That we're using right now. It's like, I lived in one room and rented out the other two rooms. It was two college students that I rented out to. And, you know, I didn't really think anything of it. It was just kind of an interesting setup. And then I moved to Charlotte, North Carolina because I bought those, those martial arts schools. And I bought a house here after renting for a little bit, just because mainly because it was like the right thing to do. And I, I did have that mindset of why would I rent something when I can buy it and be building equity. Right. Yeah. And so that was a, that was cool. And so what I ended up doing was I um, ended up moving into that house. And like I said, I'm from a big family. And so I remember just getting there the first night and being like, it's too quiet. <laughs> like I need some roommates. I need some people around. Even in my other place, I had roommates. So I started renting out some rooms. And I remember it kind of clicked for me when one of my friends who was a who was a banker at the time, a big high up banker at SunTrust, who just recently merged with Truist. Mm -hmm. And he comes to me and he's like, Hey, how much are you renting that house for? He's like, I know you've got roommates. And I was, and, and I was like, did the math. And I was like, well, between me and John and, and, and Nevin and this, and I was like, it's like 2850. And he was like, and this was not a nice house. This is like in a, you know, four bedroom, you know, three bedroom house that I converted to a fourth bedroom by putting up a wall and a door. <laughs> <laughs> and he was like, you know, that house would only rent for $1,300 a month. If you like rented it to a single family, he's like, you're more than doubling the rent on it. He's like, that's pretty cool. And he was a banker. So we kind of thought in terms of numbers. Yeah. And I was, I remember thinking like, that is pretty cool. Wonder if I could do that with five bedrooms. <laughs> and, and the long story short is then I said, I wonder, and so I, I bought a house, you know, did my three or 5% down. Cause I was just moving every year at this point. And then I was like, what about six? What about seven? What if I buy a little bigger house and, and, and I have, I have seven roommates. So my wife met me. I had six roommates. There's six of us sharing this house. And she was like, yeah, Sam, it's not going to work long-term. And I'm like, but you don't understand. Like I'm making so much money and these other houses are full. And she's like, yeah, I don't care. So I, I stumbled across this thing we now call this co-living. And, and I believe, um, I believe, it is one of the fastest ways in the real estate market today. I think it's surpassing Airbnb in terms of it's not that not that the perfect Airbnb in the perfect spot can't cash flow more, but in terms of stability, in terms of solving a real issue, we're 7 million affordable housing units short in the United States right now. Mm -hmm. You know, 48% of Americans spend 33% or more of their income on housing and 24%. And by 24%, we're talking, there's 300 million people in here. So we're talking tens and tens and tens of millions of people spend more than 50% of their income on their rent, right? Miami-Dade County alone, you mentioned Miami earlier, Miami-Dade County alone, don't quote me in the actual specific numbers, but it was like in one year, one of my buddies was telling me about this when I was down there for a conference the other day. He said, our rents increased. It was like some 26% in one year rent increase in, in like the whole, the county as a whole. It was, wow. it was in the 20s. Don't quote me in the exact numbers, in the 20s. And I was like, okay, so, so incomes aren't rising like that. So rents are rising. So we have this affordabil affordability issue, right? Yeah. And there's all kinds of stats out there. The government knows it. Everybody knows it. No one's really doing anything about it. Okay. And so co-living this, call it shared housing, call it code living, call it, call it, call it rent by the room is something that I personally have experienced. I lived in these homes for 13 years with four, five, six roommates, right? And now I just, I, now I don't live in the homes, but I invest in this. I teach people to invest in these homes and I teach people to take advantage of, of, of a really true, you mentioned earlier, I don't, I think this was off the record before we started recording about it has to be a win, 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 win. And so for us, for investors, we're taking homes that would rent for real example, 1875, according to a rent appraisal from the appraiser. And we rented it in two weeks to eight, to eight uh, tenants for 6450. So we're tripling, sometimes quadrupling rents on a home. Now, is there more management? Yes. Do you pay utilities? Yes. Is there more maintenance? Yes. 
Now, are there systems you have to have in place to make this run? Yes. You have to advertise. Yes. There's, there's a whole thing. And that's what I coach people on. And that's what I build. And that's what I help. But anyway, not to get long winded, but ultimately to bring it just to, to kind of put a bow on it. I believe this is the fastest way right now to achieve financial freedom. If you're looking to do it from real estate, not that you can't do it in business or other things, but if you're looking real estate, I believe this is the fastest uh, most profitable way that is also a huge win and has tons of social benefits. U.S. Department for Housing and Urban Development just came out and said you can now use housing choice vouchers. So like what they used to call Section 8 vouchers for co-living. They'll wow. pay you, the government will pay you to rent a room to someone who has a voucher, not the whole house. That's huge. That came out That's in January of 2021. Big. So we're starting to see this like take off. This is a movement. We're starting to see companies like Bungalow just got a $400 million valuation. All they do is they are the tech behind managing people who want to put their homes on and rent their rooms. Mm. Pad splits, another huge one, just got a valuation, I think of 150, 200 million. Oh, no real estate, but they just are the tech, right? So we're seeing this. Imagine like what Airbnb was 10 years ago. Like that's kind of where, that's kind of what this wave is. I believe, I believe it's like the blue ocean, if you will, the untouched new frontier of solving affordable housing, creating massive returns for investors and helping people create financial freedom. So I'm passionate about all of that. That's amazing. That's what I'm doing. I <laughs> love it, me, man. <laughs> I love it. Well, I'm going to jump into numbers. I just want to share it. I, I feel like we have so many correlations here. When I met my wife and she moved down from the Bay Area to San Diego because I was going to grad school and I was like, I'm not moving to Northern California. San Diego's paradise, right? right. Um, I had, I had five, four, well, five, but really four roommates that was living with me and my wife. And she was like, we're not doing this long term. And honestly, it was crazy. Three months later, my landlord at the time, which we were in there for six years, no problems, always on time. She's like, hey, you guys got to you got to split. And I was like, <laughs> my wife shows up and here we are. I got the better end of the deal. I'd rather my wife than the house. So yeah, anyway, of course. Um, of course. cool. Win. So tell me how many homes do you have that you're doing co-living with right now? It's in the twenties, um, maybe 25, 26, 27, 28, somewhere in there. <laughs> okay. 25. We'll say between 25 and 30 houses. And I, and I say that, and that might be weird that I'm giving you a range, but I truly don't know. We buy and Beautiful. sell houses all the time. And uh, we, we just sold, I just know we sold one, two, three. We just sold four short-term rentals. Is that right? One, two, three short-term rentals to redeploy into co-living. Um, we just purchased one, two, three more co-living properties and are converting them right now, rehabbing them to co-living. What, okay, so I want to jump into numbers, but when yeah. you say converting from Airbnbs to co-living, what type of construction has to go into that? Are you putting up walls to make more rooms yeah. and closets? Um, obviously, you That's have it. to wait for permits and everything, right? Yep. Yeah. So you're Got putting it. up rooms. You're putting up rooms, and you're adding bathrooms. Sweet. Got That's, it. That's ultimately what you're doing. Uh, you're still keeping a nice common space. You're you're still doing, you know, you, that's it. And you're make, maybe you add some parking to the front if there's parking needed on either side, but that's, that's ultimately what it is. I, okay, man. I got so many awesome questions. I know the audience would love to know. So first, um, what is a typical bathroom, bedroom installation, like putting up a wall for in a closet? Uh, what does that typically run on average? To, to install? Mm -hmm. So if you install like a wall in a closet, or two walls in a closet and a door, you're probably at like 2,500, three grand. And a bathroom? A bathroom in Charlotte, you're probably looking at 10 full bath, maybe 12, 10 to 12, depending, so, how, complicated, depending how complicated the plumbing situation is. Okay. So under 15 grand, you guys could add another bedroom. And what would a typical rent be for that? In, so I'll, I'll go, I'll give you, because I have, in my mastermind, we have students, in probably 30 markets, we represent almost a thousand doors. So I'm just going to kind of keep it to my market since I know it the best, which is Charlotte, North Carolina, and then Asheville, North Carolina. And even those are a little bit different. Asheville is a smaller town, but housing is more expensive there. So in Charlotte, if you have a private bath, you're probably going to rent it for a thousand, close to a thousand a month, kind of all in, maybe 1100 if it's big and has a separate entrance kind of thing. Uh, if it's a shared, if it's got a shared bath with say three other people, you're probably sevens. Okay. seven mid to high sevens. And if you share it with two other people, maybe your low eights, it must eights, 800 a month. Wow. 
So yeah. really within a year, you're pretty much getting your recoupment back from that bathroom, depending on the situation around it. So within 15 months, 15, yeah, somewhere around there, depending. Yeah, we won't, we won't really look at houses right now. They're anything less than like six rooms so or that we can make six rooms. So it's six, seven, eight or nine or 10 rooms is kind of how, it, how it boils down to what it boils down to. I'm going to ask you about your mastermind here in a little bit, um, but Okay. Awesome. So, so for on average or roughly around 15 grand, you guys can add a bedroom, a bathroom to a property. This yeah. is really exciting. I know we heard if you've, and if you're ever listening like bigger pockets or anything like that, some people say it's house hacking, right? But now you're building, you have this co-living model, which the government, it sounds like is recognizing too, with those stipends, those coupons, yep. right? Yep. Um, so obviously you fell into into this you got 15 to 30 properties roughly what do you typically do on a monthly basis after all expenses are paid so we're and it, you, you want yeah let me I, I let me give you some specific numbers let me see if i can pull up some more specific numbers how about that all right as you do that i'm gonna just share the reason guys the reason why i'm asking sam these numbers isn't because i want you to see you know oh look at how much money he's making what i want you to see is what's possible so many of you that you know that are watching at times you're so caught up in what you're doing whether it's your job and you feel stuck or your small business and you feel stuck i want you to see what's possible and if you're single you can actually take this model house hacking and then turn it into uh, co-living and you could actually create a lot of income coming in and for some of you if you're young and single watching this you could probably do one or two properties and be financially free that's our whole thing yeah. is teaching you how to create financial freedom because i always tell people financial freedom is not the end destination it's actually the starting line it's actually what you're aiming to start at because that's when you can go make an impact. And we can talk about time freedom, location freedom, emotional freedom, all mental freedom, all of that. But we want to know the reason why I'm asking Sam this is to show you what's possible. Now, it doesn't it didn't happen overnight. He's probably had a ton of mistakes, a ton of learning experiences, probably cost some tens of thousands of dollars along the way. Um, that's really to learn this. So I know I've, I've made a couple of mistakes and, you know, in my journey and it's cost me well over 10, 20, 30, $40,000 in mistakes. So they get an education. And then we have, you know, the government telling you, you need to go to college and spend 180 grand to be able to get educated for a job you won't get, but we won't go there. So anyway, yeah. Sam, you got those numbers? So my, yes, yes. Be beautiful sentiment, by the way. I love how you're presenting that. I think that's the right, really the right way to present that. So so my portfolio right now looks like about 27 homes, uh, of which it looks like eight right now are short-term rentals. We have a couple coming online, so I'm not going to give you the ones that are not online yet. So right yep. now, co-living specific homes, I have 19 that are active right now. A couple in the pipeline, but 19 active. And out of those 19 active, our, our gross revenues for May, we're 89971 Our gross revenues for June were $88,538. Um, expenses, including a management fee in May was $10,550. This does not include debt service, which I, I won't, you know. And then expenses in June were $13,000. Nice. So, so before I pay my mortgages, you know, there is just to round just to round up a little bit so there's 89 minus minus 10 on this month so 79 so 79,000 in May and say 310 so 74,000 in June and I'm sure you talk about this in your mastermind we'll talk about what when it comes to debt service do you want to be under a certain percentage when it comes to your profit, like 40% or less when it comes to debt service versus no, man, profit. What, what, yeah. What we're coaching people mostly on right now is if they buy a house, they need to be receiving 15 or more cash on cash percent of that deal. God. So you think about any investment, I put a hundred dollars in an investment. How much do you expect back in year one? Yeah. Like how many dollars? Well, for us, it's 15 off of that hundred. So if it's a 15% cash on cash return, and then we know you and I both know that real estate has appreciation yep. historically. 
depreciation on your taxes, principal pay down. And it's one of the, and it's one of the few assets, real estate is one of the few assets you can easily get leverage on through other people's money, right? From a bank. Yep. Uh, you can't easily do that with stocks, at least at large volume. You can't eat. It's just not, not for the common person. Right. So, you know, what do, what is my take home, take home on that? Gosh, if I gave it to you, it'd be a, it'd be a guess at this point. <laughs> <laughs> what about a ballpark? guess? If I'm pay, so if my payout, so my payout, and let's take May, if my payout was 70 grand, 69,000 after expense, it was 69,368. By the time I pay, by the time I pay my side and probably at, I'm probably at 50% of that back. Come on, come on. In expenses and in, in expenses and because I have to pay the utilities on my side, like the property management company, <clears throat> they, in their expenses, they pay for cleaners, lawn care, maintenance, credit card expenses, uh, and then, and then the management fee. But then on my side, I pay utilities and mortgage. By the time it. I put that back into that, I'm probably at a 50% expense ratio once that stuff is paid. So yeah. So Come if I'm on. so if so if my payout's 69,000, I'm probably getting 35 of that. <clears throat> By keeping 35 of that. And that that depending you have two options for those of you that are listening. You could do an epic trip to Bali <laughs> or you could roll that into more investments right down the line, right? And so Yeah, that's a, that's a house every 2 months if you want to. Yeah. And so the mindset is so huge there. It's so important, but all right. So look, I know even I'm learning a lot right now, but for those people that are listening to this and they're like, this is what I've been looking for. I thought I didn't know this was possible, but I felt like something like this was possible. And now you are delivering. And since you've been doing this for how many years now? I mean, I bought my first one in, I guess, when I was 19 or 20, so 32, so 12 years ago, 12, 13 years. Okay, so after the last 13 years, you've you've learned a few lessons. And so now yeah. these people that are salivating, listening to you talk about like the potential that can happen, you've actually, I'm sure over the years, people are like, dude, teach me how to do what you're, you're doing. And now you've developed a mastermind, right? Yeah. What's that yeah. called? It's it's called uh, we have two we have two programs we call twelve months to financial freedom university, and it's a sprint. It's getting people in there and just it's a sprint to financial freedom, and then we have a program called complete inner circle, which is where my team will. It's like a much more intense program. My team will actually find deals for people, oversee the rehab, fill them. They have to be in our markets because then we manage them. Yep. But that's um, those are the two programs we have. Nice. Cool. So tell us about, uh, obviously, well, tell us about your mastermind. Let let the audience know kind of what does that entail? Obviously, if they want to get in touch with you, we'll put it in the, the show notes and we'll have everything that where people can get a hold of you. But what does that include? Kind of give a, the average person that's listening, what does that entail? Yeah, it, it you know, we everybody gets started in our masterminds pretty much in the same way. You come to what I call a five day challenge. And it's, it's a challenge because it's a deep dive into financial freedom. It's a deep dive into mindset and it's a deep dive into uh, co-living and it's an hour a day for five days. So the next one we have is next month and you got to go to scale your real estate.com and register. And it's free. It's our way of offering a ton of free value. We just finished one. We had 80 people on the whole time, just soaking it up. And, and then we make, we make an offer obviously for people to join day three or four. We give people an opportunity to really um, if they like it and they're getting it and they want to do this at, they want to, this is their strategy. They want to choose. Then we can onboard them into the course, but it's, it's that simple. And if not, there's a bunch of people, you know, if not, that's fine too. It's just a way people can kind of learn more about me and my team and what we're doing. Tell us, I'm, I'm always, I'm all about success stories. So do you have a student in your mastermind that just they're, they're crushing it because they came in just a novice and now they're just, they're financially free. Do you have someone like that, that you could share their testimony? Yeah, we have a bunch. <laughs> um, one of my, one of my favorites was one of the first people that, that enrolled though. It's like, you, you, you always remember your, your first couple, right? Uh, his name is Mike and he's a high, he's a science, he's a high school science teacher. And he sold a property that he had as traditional rental and he went all in and he learned a ton of lessons. He was one of my first coaching clients actually in this space. So I was actually like kind of learning too, along with those. Like, and I remember telling my team, I was like, 
fish better work. <laughs> like he was doing it in a different market. He didn't have my 13 years experience and he just went all in and he just absolutely did an amazing job. He filled his first house within a couple of months, rehabbed it. He turned it from like a three bedroom into a six or seven bedroom, I think. And um, yeah, he's, he rented a house that would probably normally rent for 15, 1600. His gross rents were like 52, 80. And he still had one uh, room in the back that he was gonna, that he was gonna rent for. And I don't know exactly what his expense ratio was on that home, but I, I think it netted him pretty close to two grand. Nice. Um, it was, it was, it was, it was in Hampton, Virginia. So it wasn't like a high cost area. Um, but we're seeing that we're seeing a lot of these homes net someone on the low end, 1500 a month on the very low end. And on the high end, you can find something at three grand. So if you, you just imagine if your financial freedom number is six grand a <clears> month, <throat> 72,000 a year. If that's like your base level, maybe not your like baller number. Maybe that's your ramen noodle number, <laughs> financial freedom. I, I call that the survival level. Yeah. I call it the ramen noodle. So we're, yeah, same, nice. same. So it's like, if someone's at that level, then like, imagine only having to get like, one of the things I promote to people is like, what if you could, what if you could retire with five homes or less, like totally retire? What if you could retire in three homes or two, or at least get yes. super significantly of the way there. And it's the only vehicle that I know right now that that's really doing it in a stable way where you've got, where you're not like, oh, I hope I have a booking next week. I hope a booking. I hope Airbnb doesn't shut me down. Hope Airbnb doesn't, shut, you know, hope I don't have a big party. Like this is just, you got tenants, they live there, it's home. They sign their 12 month agreements and like it's that's multifamily it. income on single family, single family asset. Like what else do you want? <laughs> what I love <clears throat> about the co-living is uh, guys, I'm listening. I'm learning more about this as, as you are. Right. And what I love about this is, Co-living, what 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 makes it different than Airbnbs? You just talked about a lot of it. I I just had a problem the other day, uh, two weeks ago when I was in California. We we're on a trip, big important situation going on, and my tenant came late and something happened. They must have messed up the code or something. They couldn't get in. They called Airbnb and they canceled her res reservation because my business partner, whose number was on the account, was in Alaska camping with no service. And so they penalize us. It's like, but what there I are, love, go ahead. No, go for, I was just gonna say, there are thousands of these stories. I just had one of my big, like $800,000 properties. Yeah, they like, we had, it was a bachelor party and they were like a little bit too loud. Neighbor called the cops and neighbor called Airbnb. And Airbnb, no warning, was just like, we're delisting you for 30 days in the middle of summer. I mean, we're talking probably oh. like 15 or 20 grand a month. And I'm like, like what do you mean? Like, we tried, like we called supervisor. No, your punishment is your, and it's just like, you hold none of the cards. Is that what you want as an investor? Like, no. Right. Anyway. Sorry. What I love. Thank you for letting me. <laughs> well, wait, look, we're not, we're not here to put down STRs. All right. For those that are <laughs> listening that love that game and it, it, you can make money. Don't get me wrong. Um, however, what I love about this is, and this is something I'm really passionate about when it comes to people on their path to financial freedom. And this is huge. You don't want to go in all excited. Oh, I'm going to make a ton of money. How do you mitigate your risk? And if you have one tenant who leaves in a co-living, you're good. But if you don't have someone that rents you in a short-term rental for a week or two weeks, especially in the middle of the summer, you're hurting. So co-living, as I'm hearing it, is a great way to minimize your risk in your investment, but have massive upside. And I remember when I worked for Tony Robbins, his money master to game book, uh, money master to game book came out and there was someone in there. Maybe it was Peter Drucker or someone. They said that if it's not a 15 to one reward, the risk ratio, they weren't going to invest in it. Wow. And it was like, and I could see the co living is not going to give you a 15 to one, really. Um, but wow. it's a way better odds than long term, medium, or short term rental. And that's what I love about what you're doing here. You're spreading the risk out so much, but maximizing the upside. I, I think that's brilliant. And, and, and Joe, and not even to mention the social benefits. <clears throat> Every and look, I mean, and I'm and I'm an, I'm an entrepreneur, so we got to we go a lot of times. I'm an investor, we go where the money is. But I had a lady tell me one time in one of my seminars, she goes, Sam, I was about to buy, she had a chunk of cash she had received. She goes, I was about to buy three short-term rentals. She's like, but I'm not, I'm going to go all in on co-living. And the reason why is because I knew every short-term rental I took, I was literally like taking a house off the market that someone would need to live. And but this is a problem, by the way, in every major city. 
And it's why the regulations are so intense. Everybody's like, oh, the regulations, regulations for short-term rental. It's like, guys, this is the cities literally fighting for people that need to move to the cities and actually live there. Mm, <laughs> like they good. are like, I get it from the city's perspective. Asheville, which is a very popular tourist town is like a complete ban in the city. They're like, no, because if we let you, we know all y'all investors going to come in and buy up everything. And like the people that actually want to live in Asheville, they aren't going to live here. Yeah. And it's so it's so it is a good thing in that way. Co-living completely the opposite. Let me take a house. And in real estate, there's this concept of what's the highest and best use. What's the highest and best use for a house with four bedrooms? For all four bedrooms to be used. <laughs> like I live in a, I'm in, a, I'm sitting in a five bedroom house right now that my wife and I live in. We don't even walk into those rooms. Like it's the worst. I'm, I'm calling myself out here because it's the worst use of space. I'm like, what? I tell my wife this regularly. I'm like, we do not need this house. It's too effing big. It's too, you know, we just don't need it. It's right. not the highest and best use. Co living. You, you can go to bed at night knowing you are you are providing you are helping solve the affordable housing crisis so that's i'm, I'm i'll get off my my soapbox but i just had to throw that in there because it's like if we're just talking money sure we can compare apples to apples but if you're talking what we call a heart paycheck yeah doesn't even compare <laughs> like yeah, I, we, amen, we, man all right before we run into wrap before we wrap some things up i just wanted to ask because a lot of people are listening they're like okay run out rooms and all this but you talked about a co-living space. Who's responsible for a kitchen? If you have six people in a house and the living room and clean up and people complain, like how do you navigate that? And we'll do, go on a macro level. If you guys want more of the details and systems and all that, you know, go to his mastermind, check it out, go, do his five day event so you guys can see. But yeah, if you could go from a macro level, how do you handle that? Yeah, professional clean. We used to not do this, but we do professional cleaners twice a month now. So that's that they just clean the common areas. So it's a fairly inexpensive clean, but they just clean the common areas. Everybody's responsible for cleaning their room. And then we also have a list. Each each tenant that comes into the house is responsible for doing certain things every week. And they can easily opt out of it so they don't feel like they're teenagers and there's an actual chore list, which is basically we don't call it that. We call it something way fancier, but it's basically a chore list. Uh, but what we do is if someone is like, I'm not gonna do that and I'll never do that, it's forty dollars extra a month, and then we just tack it onto the rent and they never have to do it. Sweet. And then do you, who do you have to do it? Have a cleaner do it or just have the, cool. the cleaners are kind of coming twice a week, twice a month, regardless. It's really just the people doing it is like just to extra keep it up. <laughs> yeah. Gotcha. Cool, man. I love that. I love that. Do you do, do you allow pets? No pets. Good call. Guys, I can't <laughs> tell you when urine stains seep into the board, like down to the floor and you tr even trying to seal it with a sealant under the carp, it doesn't always work. Oh, it's a mess. So good call on that. I love that. All right, real quick. I want to just touch. So you're teaching people co-living. You're, you guys have your own business. Do you have anything else? You own any other businesses, any other types of real estate out there? Yeah, I own a commercial building that one of my martial arts schools is in. I own, uh, um, I'm a, I'm a, my wife and I are 50% owner in a, in a short term rental property management company that manages in Asheville and Charlotte. Wouldn't have done that without um, two amazing partners that we have that really are the tech side behind it. They do so well with that. Um, we launched it for ourselves, but now we manage for others. And I own a property management company that manages co living. That is a separate entity. And we just literally, like, I can show you the certificate. It's in my drawer. Just got our, full like property management certificate and we technically have been managing other people's properties for a little while but we're now officially do that and now we're, we're looking to scale and, and ramp that up and then uh scale real estate is the coaching company that i run and that is that is a big that's probably my biggest focus right now is um you know we call i say build teach manage so i'm we're gonna we're actually we're actually working on developing we have three pieces of land we're developing co-living buildings on from the ground up i think that's the real future because then you can just build however many bathrooms you want uh, right from the get-go. So build and then teaching people, sharing this model, spreading the word, helping solve affordable housing, build, teach, and then manage. And now we're managing at least in the markets that we that we can. That's amazing, man. So with everything going on, um, you got into co-living how long ago? I mean, technically 13 years, I guess. 13 years, <laughs> my awesome. First three bedroom condo, yeah. <laughs> and you were at that point just running a martial arts studio or two? Yeah. So in that 13 year period, you know, um, I can only imagine where you were, where would you, where do you estimate right now? I know in GoBundance, we do this all the time with our, uh, our one sheets, but where would you say your net worth is now? I keep track of it pretty regularly. It's close to 12, 12 or 13. So, 
and that's with a, a big M behind it, guys. Not, uh, you know, anything, not a T. Um, so with that being said, I want, again, I want you to see that what's possible. So many people are so focused on how can I make money this month? How can I make as much money in the next three months? But really wealth is a long-term game over a 12 to 13 year period. Basically almost, a, uh, if we average it out, almost a mil a year. Yeah. But that's, and I need to, for transparency, uh, my, my wife received a million inheritance in there that definitely helped. Um, and it, and is included in that we were doing well before the martial arts schools were doing well, everything was still cranking, but that was a nice, that was a nice gas to pour on the fire for sure. <laughs> oh yeah, absolutely. So even if, even for those of you that are listening, even if that million that it helped accelerate that wasn't in the picture, you could still probably be around five, 6 million. How many yeah, of you would like, had, yeah. right. How many of you would like to be there compared to where you are? And this isn't a knock on you. This is to show you like, hey, you can play life at a bigger game. And here's a vehicle, right? Someone who's actually doing it and teaching it, right? Here's a vehicle to be able to do that. And so now it's up to you. It's your choice on what you want to do. You can go and try and figure it out yourself and make the same mistakes Sam made and his team. Or you can just go learn how to fold time and just get all the answers and all the systems and processes all from his mastermind. Um, I don't get any affiliation with it, but I do I do know what it's like to be a part of a mastermind that folds time for people. And so that's why I'm sharing it with you guys. So definitely make sure you check it out. Sam, we will definitely um, put everything in the show notes for people if they want to join your challenge or whatnot. Um, all right. So last parting questions here. Uh, what is one book that truly impacted your life outside of Rich Dad, Poor Dad or Think and Grow Rich? Those are some of the common answers, but what's one book? <laughs> that if people needed to read it it's like you're like this Dude, one that's great i've been on a decent number of podcasts i've never had someone automatically exclude certain answers <laughs> i like that that's good um so i would say the surrender Exper experiment by michael singer has been a really powerful book for me um in just letting go i am i am 100 percent a control freak if you measure me on the disc i'm high d and i'm high c which c Ooh. is control and <laughs> so it's Stop like go yes, breaking like gas Dude, it's, you get it. Okay. That's exactly my life. I'm like, yes. Oh my gosh. Is it all right? <laughs> um, so yeah, hundred percent. I would say that has really helped me just wrap my head more around letting go and be more calm when, when things don't always go my way. Yeah. Such a good book. Such a good book. Yeah. Um, and his, uh, his other book that he wrote. Feathered Souls. Badass. His, yeah. His just, yeah. Anyway. Um, yeah. We won't go down there. All right. One piece of advice you got in your life outside of the mentor, but one piece of advice that you got in your life that really kind of was a pivoting point for you that started to shape who you are today. It was the stuff we were talking about, man. It was leverage. Mm -hmm. It was, um, it came a lot from David Osborne. When I first joined Go Abundance, I got to meet and know David Osborne. And he, he really taught me some great principles about, he, he one day he just told me, he said, Hey, Sam, and David Osborne is a is a best-selling author of a book called uh, Wealth Can't Wait, and and also, you know, hundred plus millionaire and 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 a friend, and um, yeah, he just taught me. He said, Sam, I'm not good at a lot of things, but I have learned to be successful in my life through leveraging other people's skills and talents. And leverage to me is not always with money. Leverage to me is a lot of times with other people's smarts. He's like, I just want to partner with the smartest people in the room. That's all I want. That's what I want to do. And that's what I'm constantly looking to do. Yeah. Similar to what you were saying about Jeff Hoffman, like his number one job is to find a plus talent and find a way to work with him. Yeah. And that changed my mind. It made me realize that, you know, one of my mentors talks about there's four levels of value in life. You can be an implementer, the person who digs the ditch. That's the lowest level of value. The person who does the work, you use your muscles. And then you, their second level of value is a unifier, someone who organizes the people that do the work. And then you can be someone who communicates and communicators get paid big money. Think A-list actors or A-list actresses or singers or communicators like you and I, right? And you use your mouth to make money. You speak to make money. And the highest level of value that you can provide is imagination. And those are the mm -hmm. Walt Disney's, the Elon Musk of this world, right? It's you're using your mouth and you're using your mind and your money to make money. And so that piece of advice, honestly, those four distinctions changed my game because I realized I was in a lot of implementation and I was a lot of unification. I was good at those two. 
And I said, I want to get out of those, not because I, I'm better than that. I just said, I want to spend my time imagining and communicating that imagination. And that allowed me to move into a space where I'm more leveraged than I've ever been before and was really powerful for me. That's amazing. So yeah. good. So good. I love that. Um, I could go on from some of the things that you were just saying there, but it really powerful. Um, actually, some of those books we'll put in the show notes. We I haven't read them. So excited to uh excited to read them more. Look, I tell people we there's I always say people are like, oh, who should I listen to? Tony Robbins or Dave Ramsey or you know, mm. Robert Kiyosaki. Look, everyone has a philosophy. You just have to pick one to subscribe to. And I hear people say, you know, double down on your strengths or, hey, work on your weaknesses. And guess what? They're both right. But <laughs> what I will say is they're both right in their field, right? Mm. If an athlete does not work on their weaknesses, they're going to get exposed and they're going to be out of the league quickly. So you have to work on it in the athletic world. You have to work on your weaknesses. If you work on your weaknesses in businesses, you're going bankrupt right? You want to leverage someone else's strength. That is your weakness. And when you can do that, yeah. you can see out so quickly. And that's where you're saying partnering. And so there's, there's so many lessons we could oh, go sure. so much deeper in that, but Sam, dude, I appreciate your interview today. Like you brought it and I'm so excited for everyone Thanks, to get brother. a chance to listen to this. Um, I know you run your mastermind. You have your five day challenge. Why don't you tell us about uh, how they can sign up one more time? And then if people want to get in contact with you, how can they follow you or get, get a hold of you? Yeah, just uh, scaleyourrealestate.com. Just how it sounds. Scaleyourrealestate.com uh, is how you can get started on the co-living journey if you're interested or just follow me at Sam Wiegert on Instagram is probably where I'm most active right now. Would love to connect with anybody listening. Awesome. Well, thanks, Sam, brother. thanks for having uh, coming on today. It's been yeah. awesome having you. You rocked it, man. Thank you for having me, man. This was an honor. Thanks. It was great to get to know you, kind of have that back and forth. I really appreciate that. Absolutely. Thank All right, guys. Well, hey, make sure that you share this as with as many people as you possibly can. Give it a thumbs up. Most importantly, hit that subscribe button and that notification button so that you can get more interviews like this coming out so that you can learn the tips, tricks, or nuggets that you need to get to your path of financial freedom. But again, thank you, Sam, for coming on. I am Joe Moffitt with Master Life by Design. Today was the Millionaire Series. Make sure you subscribe and we will see you on the next episode. All right, have a good one, guys. See ya. Bye.